Sunday early morning session. The structure of the program is this. It's two parts, uh, two talks in a row, so a little break in between. And uh, part one is opened uh, by Robert Wong, uh, and he will speak on the asymptotic formula in Barry's problem. Please work. Thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, usually it's a delight to be here. I'm very much enjoying the class. Um, and what I want to talk about today is um, uh, some joint work with Trevor Woolley. Um, and you shouldn't be very surprised to learn this is where he's from. Um, so, um, So, um, I'm concerned today with the asymptotic formula in Waring's problem. Um, actually, this is a problem, really, which has been a huge amount of movement in, quite a lot of movement in recent times. Um, so, if you take R sub S of A and what K is greater than 1, and, um, typically greater than 2, actually, let R sub S of N denote the number of representations of N to some S K power of positive then there's this famous work of Hardy and Littlewood in one of their early papers on the title of the problems of particular in Aurora, um, which uh, is really an immediate consequence of uh, this very famous paper of, uh, of Hardy and Littlewood, which the movie was largely some concern with yesterday. Um, so what they discovered was that the massive toy formula for R sub S of M as a general shape, this is the gamma function. This is the so-called singular series. And then we have N, uh, a power of N. Uh, the singular series, um, I usually write it in this form. Um, this is a Gauss sum associated with K powers. Um, the general term is not clear, uh, so it can be written as an Euler product. And it ref in some sense, the, the properties of this series reflect the local properties of um, representing a number of some best case power, in other words, the solubility modulo powers of primes. Okay, and uh, they had, uh, well, it was a breakthrough at the time, they had this um, upper bound for S sub zero of K, the smallest S, for which they could get the asymptotic formula. Um, and there's been a huge amount of work in between. Um, I just listed a few of the people who've been involved. Uh, most famously, Vera Bradov, of course, and Huar, and uh, Pete Brown, and Ken Hoff, and Jeremy Woolley. Um, when we actually wrote the paper only uh, sort of three years ago, initially, um, I think these were actually the best that was known for uh, S sub zero of K. Um, and, of course, the recent work by Will Gandhi <coughs> um, has probably enabled us to get down to K squared plus K plus one and to really check the details of that. And there's some work of Woolley also in the, in the pipeline, which is probably getting down to that as well. Um, but today I'm not very concerned with the possible S which can be used to, um, in the asymptotic formula, which we give an asymptotic formula. Um, so let me just remind you, this is the asymptotic formula. And generally, if you're trying to prove that this uh, function is positive from some point onwards, you're quite satisfied to get an error term, a relative error term of this kind. And I think that's... Uh, um, that was that's generally state of play. Um, and delta can be quite small. Um, you just you, you try and make S as small as possible, uh, but get a delta just positive. Uh, so delta in many um, circumstances can be very small. Um, so the question that we were concerned with is, is there some more precise uh, approximation for R sub S of N? And does it have any peculiar features? Okay, so let me just remind you of, of the asymptotic formula, the, the singular series of my 
provided. Um, I mentioned. Um, oh yes, well the other factor here is gamma factor times n to the x over k minus one could also be called the density of the real solutions of the underlying equation. Um, so you can think of this being a cooperation, though I'm sure that's not what we do. Now, um, okay, so this is the uh, first theorem we can prove. Um, so let's see. We're assuming that uh, k is even in this theorem. We'll take, we've got some parameter j, um, and I'll, I will t eventually tell you what j at this point means. Um, we're just going to suppose for the time being that a S is J admissible for K. Uh, also, there's an inequality of this kind here. Um, and delta 2 doesn't really matter very much. Um, basically, uh, the crucial thing is J times K. Um, and then we have this asymptotic formula with a, a better error term um, than is usually given. And there's a series of, of terms um, in uh, negative powers of, of rel relative to the main term in, in negative powers of uh, n to the 1 over k. And the general term here, well, there's a lot of familiar friends here. We have a binomial coefficient. We have a typical gamma factor. Now, um, uh, um, uh, uh, translated by an S minus J. We have a singular series now for S minus J K powers. And uh, um, that's, um, you know, we have an expansion here and we understand all the terms of this pretty much, as long as S minus J is large enough. Um, so all the trans
uh, take the, the classic results and then for higher powers of T you can save uh, um, more on each individual um, generating function here by using um, fairly simple estimates uh, that come out of this. The classic varying problem of the probe. And um, if you go back, uh, well, this is somewhat historical now, but if you go back um, um, far enough, um, remember, um, <coughs> uh, S0, um, uh, well, an SJ, and uh, if S0 is zero admissible, then um, one can show that the hardly is the gas and toy coal. This is a classic result, um, just uh, predicated on having a, a decent bound of this, which just has a unusual possible. Okay. So that's all classically uh, known. The question of what size you need to take T in order to, for this to be true is uh, something I don't want to really get into very closely at the moment because it's. it's Um, so, um, there's a, as, as I mentioned earlier, there's kind of a flux in, in, in um, various things connected to these mean values, in particular the big graph mean value theorem um, is a moving target, um, or has been for a while. So, uh, the main thing I want to talk about is, is um, um, the application of uh, results like this. Okay, so. Um, we're going to define an exponent. It doesn't really uh, concern us very much um, what the actual values are. The main thing is it exists. Um, and as I say, with, uh, with the very recent developments, one can probably improve this a little bit. Um, then we can show that S is new admissible if, if K. Uh, for k when s is greater than this okay. So the main thing to say is the existence of the point. And uh, um, this, this is certainly out of date now, uh, but I'm not very concerned about that. Okay. So um, in explaining things to you so far, I've uh, I've um, Concentrated on the case where k is even. Um, and we recall this is the basic theorem. We, uh, what I stated that we have this uh, extended uh, expansion um, with uh, general terms to this point. Um, and as I said earlier, this would be pretty boring if that was the whole story. Um, in fact, as long as s minus j is large enough, we know this is down to the bottom below, down to the weight of zero, down to above, so you know pretty much exactly what's going on. Okay, so um, fortunately when K is odd, something interesting happens. And I'm going to have to introduce a new exponential sum. So previously we just had the, the Gauss sum. Now we have a rather more interesting sum. Um, and uh, a new kind of singular series, where now um, J of the Gauss sums are replaced by this new sum. And the behavior of, of this uh, series is um, not that well understood, um, <coughs> mostly because it does not have an Euler product. Um, and as you might guess, that presumably means that it's not always positive. And in fact, um, we, we should see that sometimes it is negative. Um, this is something we would have to look at in a little detail. And now, this is the theorem for odd k. 
And now, well, the expansion as I read it looks the same as before, except now, instead of the classic singular series, we have the new singular series. And, of course, um, you know, we can always recover, of course, the classic result of, of this theorem. Um, but one of the things that um, we did know was that there's this um, there's a paper of, by Anthony Lowe in 1996 which shows that, that, that you can't have too good an approximation with, with just the main term. In fact, he showed that the difference between R sub S of N and uh, this quantity here, maybe the first term here, in other words, is actually only there of n to the s minus 1 over k minus 1. So, um, it, and it was one of the, this, was, this result was one of the things that stimulated us to start looking to see if there was what, something going on. Um, this theorem now explains why you get omega here in a rather concrete way. So what's going on? Well, um, let me just uh, look at this interesting Gauss sum for a while. It's a worthy of studying its own writer. I don't know whether we should call it Gauss sum or not, but uh, it's, um, um, it has some interesting properties. Um, so if you replace uh, uh, Q by uh, U by Q minus U, you can see that you get this relation here. Um, and so, if, if, that is if k is even. And so, in, in the case k is even, um, it's a rather simple uh, sum. And um, if you insert this fact into the first theorem I showed you, you get the, the two, it transpires that the two theorems are identical. Okay. So where does uh, this sum come from? Okay, so let's go back to the generator. And, of course, um, we are really only concerned with what's going on in the major arcs. So, um, one way of approximating this uh, exponential sum on the major arcs is to write it as um, in this form. Um, so at the center of the, of the arc, you're basically, so if you have alpha equals a over q, just by dividing into residue classes, you would get um, um, an expression called sqa divided by q times uh, p. In other words, sqa times q over q. Um, and you get that very easily by just dividing into, say, the residue classes. Um, yeah. And by working a bit at it, you can get quite a decent error term. But uh, then, um, as um, you move away from this central point in your interval, a and q, you move away from that, well, you, you expect some decay. And this integral, uh, in some sense, represents that decay. Okay, so um, even if you were just uh, trying to get the that's the result, you would probably start off by writing the s power of f, this is the exponential sum here in this form, and then um, you, you get to use, say, the binomial theorem, in the case j equals zero would give the main term v to the capital V to the s, and then for the other terms, you just use your estimate for f minus d. So I'm repeat that here. Um, Okay, so the thing to do in our situation is to retain these terms. <laughs> I probably managed to do something <laughs> possible. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so, um, and as you can imagine, if you if you um, if you 
start looking at other terms here, well, there are obviously going to be complications. And I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, discussing because things are complicated. I just want to illustrate what's going on. So I'm just going to concentrate on the term J equals 1. Um, and remember, to, to make things work on the minor arcs, we had to take S somewhat larger than normal, and that's going to help us here as well. Um, so, to start off with, um, it's uh, classical that if you um, Okay, if you define um, this function, oh, it should be an n again, not an n, by the way. Um, it should be an n. Uh, this, you define this function to be the integral over, over the, the whole of the major arcs, where the V of alpha takes on the appropriate values on the integrals. Then uh, you get the, the, the expected expansion, the expected main term, and then you get an error um, and you can actually get, at this stage, for this expression, you can actually get a, a rather good error term. Um, and so, uh, for the purposes of this exposition, I'm going to ignore it. Um, and normally, we would just use this on the term j equals, j equals 0. Well, let me show you what happens if we also use this result on the term j equals 1. So, I've uh, rewritten this now with n. And so we have, um, this is the term corresponding to j equals 1, so we'd actually have a, a j up from the guess. Oh, I can't that out. Um, I can the guess. So we have v of alpha to the s minus 1 times f of alpha minus v of alpha, twisted by uh, the usual factor, m. And we get a difference of essentially two of these functions. Well, yeah, an average of one minus um, another one. So, this, <coughs> so we have a v the s minus one times f of alpha minus v of alpha to the s. So the v of alpha to the s, we can just write this straight away in this form. And for the other one, well, what we do is write f of alpha out as a sum, interchange the order of summation integration, and then apply this with t equals s minus one. And when you do this, um, of course, you get uh, um, gamma factor, you get um, uh, the s minus first power of the, of the Gauss sum, and then you get um, some stuff that you have to deal with. And the stuff looks like this. You get, of course, now because of this factor here, this, this, this value, value to that, you get now <coughs> n minus n to the k to the s minus 1 over k minus 1. And uh, then you get um, a piece here, which, which is, um, well, this is actually a kind of fudge factor, which uh, when you multiply by this, it actually gives the equivalent, uh, which is what you expect from, from the v to the s. Now we have to put, figure out what's going on with this sum. And we've got this quite nice smoothing factor here. Um, and it's, well, there are various ways of tackling this, but the um, first thing to try is the Oedemann thorough summation. And you, you, know, you sort the terms according to the residue classes, and then in each residue class you apply the Oedemann thorough summation formula. And of course, the Bernoulli polynomials occur naturally in that formula. Um, and um, you just take the first term in the expansion, what you get is so your favorite Bernoulli. And so. Well, maybe refreshments or something. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, the integral here that you get um, is a, is a well, it's a bit of function 
so it's of course a, a ratio of gamma functions. And when you um, insert that information, uh, you get that this um, expression uh, um, is never ever really explicitly, you get uh, an expression of the score, or approximately the score, or the gain, good error. To so, um, and so that gives uh, the, the terms corresponding to J equals 1. You can carry out this kind of analysis for larger J. Um, of course, it gets more elaborate, but it's perfectly doable. And when you do that, you get um, the, the theorem. So, I've got four minutes to tell you something about this singular series. Okay. So, um, I think, um, well, I think that Freeman K are not very excited. Um, odd K we have, for example, is okay. So, you can actually prove a few things about these uh, singular series, or these new singular series, one of which you can see that um, for J equals 1, you get minus half of the classical singular series at S minus 1. So, actually, of course, that will be. That single series is positive, it's a large number, and so this will be negative. At least it was large number. Okay, so this is, of course, for a rather special choice of N. Um, and this is rather easy to see. You see what's going on. Um, is that in the singular series, all the small values of little q, that twisting factor e of minus a over qn is going to be give you one. Um, <coughs> and you can make use of that. Um, in fact, this is an outline here of the arguments uh, one can say something about the new gauss sum, and um, then you plug that in, and detail spend time on that. And then um, okay, so you get various relationships like this between these various singular series. And uh, now if you suppose that n is a multiple of q factorial, then this is behaving like the same thing as zero, and that's behaving like the same thing as minus n. So these are essentially the same. So that, that um, one of these is behaving like minus half. Um, there are other theorems one can prove. Um, for example, um, you, can, you can work out um, the L, what L2 means of uh, these things, and from that you can show that uh, they are actually um, bounded away from zero a good deal of the time. Um, and the argument, um, well, uh, just briefly give it here, you truncate the series with this is converging absolutely, um, some error term, and then you, you um, can apply uh, various um, standard estimates and things like this, the regional segment, you can suit, for example, put this inequality, and you can get a lower bound for this object like this, and the Q is a bit smaller than the end. Time uh, this um, is bound to work zero. So that's a, another piece of jigsaw. Um, okay. So um, okay. There's probably something more precise that can be shown. I wouldn't be surprised if I could show that they're non-zero at all end. Um, Um, it is possible. The, the original singular series, of course, reflects the number of solutions of the underlying associated congruence. In other words, the local solutions. You, um, you can actually write the new singular series in the same way, um, but the general term is, is going to be 
twisted by a factor half minus a over q. So those, if there's no local solution, those singular series will also be zero. So the, so there are, there's still connections with the local solubility. It's just that you can't get at that through the through model problem. Anyway. Um, there's still some intriguing open questions here, and uh, yeah. both Patricia and I use the consultant. Questions, comments? I think we have to leave it as this because time is an issue. So let's thank the speaker again. <laughs>